Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. This is the second video in my series about the six tornadoes that um, that reached my region on uh, Friday, uh, September 21st, uh, just a few days ago. So two of these tornadoes, in fact, the two largest, the EF3, uh, formed just west of Kilbourne and then came across and hit Dunrobin and continued on a on its path across the Ottawa River and reached the um, reached Gatineau, parts of Gatineau, just north of the river across from Ottawa, and that was an EF3, and the second largest was the EF2, which touched down somewhere, you know, in in in, in South Ottawa, and it came across, um, tracked across, um, causing lots of damage in parts of those regions, and there was a power station. Uh, a uh, transformer station that supplies 40% of the electricity to Ottawa and it was basically um, wiped out. There was debris from from roofs and things that went into the transformer station and it was out of commission. So most of Ottawa lost their power for about a day or so and then it started coming back. Ottawa Hydro rerouted around that um, station and uh, got most places got power back. Um, within on, on the weekend sometime with, within within two or three days so one of the key things i was discussing at the end of last video was the very fast forward speed of this uh tornado the the ef3 so the cold front that came through and generated this storm system um had very fast forward speeds of 80 kilometers an hour so i talked about how uh that really limits the time the, the tornado is over a certain region, so with a one kilometer swath, that, that would completely clear past a region in in um, one eightieth of an hour, which is uh, three quarters of a minute, which is about 45 seconds. If the swath diameter was half a kilometer, it would be half the time. So because, and of course, if the forward speed was half the speed, then you double the time that that tornado was sitting over a region. So it's a bit of a trade-off. I mean, the very fast 80 kilometer an hour speed, it added to the damages in the um, right front quadrant of the tornado, obviously, um, but it meant that the tornado was only over a given area for a shorter period, period of time. So it was a bit of a, of a trade-off in terms of the um, damages. I also mentioned that, you know, this isn't Kansas. This is this is the Ottawa region. There's lots of trees, lots of forests. Um, there's rugged hill. There's hills. There's there's hills and valleys. There's some rugged regions. Um, and uh, so it's basically it's not flat and it doesn't have the grass and dust available to be pulled up into the tornado to give it the, the visible funnel that you see. So um, you know, it appeared that uh, some of these tornadoes were very difficult to see, whether that's because they're shrouded in rain or they just didn't pick up enough debris to be clearly visible. Um, so out, um, you know, where the EF3 kind of touched down, um, west of uh, Kilbourne, uh, which is west of Dunrobin, um, there's dense forests and, and, and stuff. So I went out there, I went and surveyed the damage of a lot of these storms. I went out on Monday for the day uh, with a meteorologist friend and we took lots of pictures um, and surveyed the damages. And the, the, um, there, there's a ridge of sort of forests um, and then it kind of drops off as you go east towards um, Dunrobin. So the tornado caused tremendous damage, you know, as it, as it cut across roads and stuff, but it would have lost, you know, most of the trees, if you talk about trees being 100 or 150 feet high, you know, 30 meters, maybe take the 30 to 50 meter level above the ground, and the energy in the tornado is chewing up stuff in that region, and that must take energy out of the, the storm, and then the upper part of the tornado, of course, up to the clouds is still rotating very strongly. So as the tornado clears that area, it would, you know, the air would be dragged around and, and the lower speeds next to the ground would be greatly increased back up almost to the speed throughout the funnel. So what I'm saying is there's subtle details here 
um, you know, which explain why some places, some houses get totally trashed if they're in the front right quadrant of the t tornado where the translation speeds adds to the rotation speed, assuming the tornado is um, moving counterclockwise, rotating counterclockwise. If it's rotating, rotating clockwise, it's opposite to what I'm saying. Uh, but most tornadoes, I believe, are rotating counterclockwise, as which is the direction that tropical storms and hurricanes, cyclones rotate in the northern hemisphere because of the Coriolis force, the rotation of the Earth. So the front left quadrant from the tornado's perspective is where the velocity would be lower. Um, so is this thing, but this thing's moving 80 kilometers. So, you know, if you're in the valleys and stuff, uh, you know, some trees and things are untouched. Um, so the, the tornado is kind of skipping or jumping across the horizon, you know, chewing up stuff, weakening in the lower air, regaining strength, etc. But also another factor I noticed in our surveying of the damages was um, you'd have the path, say, over there somewhere, and then there'd be trees close to you that are all sheared off at the top in a, in a small region of the forest. So I think what's happening is I think there's micro vortices or these small satellite vortices that are actually spun off the tornado, meander away from the main path and can do damage on their own to, to a small region. Um, also, because of the great rotation of the tornado, you know, it's guided by the, um, either the jet streams or the storm front and so on. Um, it's still trying to find a bit of a path of least resistance. It's still rotating very fast, so there's going to be torque. And, you know, if it wasn't guided, other factors being equal, you'd expect it to run in a curved path around the ground because of this tremendous rotation speed. Um, but there's other guiding factors. Um, and uh, also, um, you know, along the whole cold front, there were very, very high winds. So, you know, in touring around Gatineau, um, there was a particular building that was L-shaped, nowhere near the path of the tornado. But there, there was a massive willow tree that was within the L-shaped region that had been knocked over. So this is just high winds, but the, we all know about the wind tunnel effect between strong buildings, right? Winds can be amplified there because uh, it has nowhere else to go. It's sort of compressed and pushed between the buildings. So we can see that effect depending on the shape of buildings. So in particular, this L-shaped building, the winds went in there and they concentrated, maybe got some rotation and took out the, the, the willow tree. So there's lots of localized um, effects and things that are happening with these storms. Now I'm gonna get back to my computer monitor and I'm gonna start talking about some more of the science of these tornadoes. So this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. Um, and I'll have a tornado post on here fairly soon with all these tornado videos that I'm generating. This is, I was talking about the Blue Ocean event um, just uh, last week. Um, and also, um, I just want to remind you that the only, um, I generate these videos, loads of videos. I've got hundreds and hundreds of videos and it's, uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of planning and thinking. So please consider, you know, donating to my PayPal account. Um, it's the only funding I get to continue these videos, so if you've done that, I, I thank you. Okay, so um, basically, um, if you go to Twitter and you do a search for um, Gatineau, G-A-T-I-N-E-A-U, Gatineau, um, you know, you can see and look at recent posts and things. You can see all kinds of information about what happened there. There's first person accounts. Um, this person was in a car, the windows got blown out, etc. Now, um, I don't want to focus on all of that. Um, this is an example of, you know, look what's going on there. There's lots of rain, but I think there's a tornado possibly within that um, rain band. And over here, look at the debris on the ground here. Okay, what's going on here? Um, it, it looks like possible rotation and a funnel, but it's clear. And then you see the rotation on the ground here and there was a flash from a power line. So, you know, this that's what I mean about the visibility of these tornadoes Could, can be in question depending on the terrain um, that there is, um, that the thing is going over. Again, it's not Kansas. It doesn't have the grass and the soils and stuff. This is a, a drone view, I believe, of the uh, damages in Dunrobin from, from the uh, EF3. Now, 
Um, I want to just show you, this is my Facebook page, and, and these are some of the questions that I was asking, and I'll just reiterate, because this is very important. If the tornado is a kilometer wide, rotating counterclockwise, rotation speed is 150 kilometers an hour, that would be an EF1 category, 150 kilometers an hour. If it's moving forward slowly, um, you know, it's an EF1, say 20 kilometers, and then the speed variation from the right quadrant to the left quadrant would be 170 down to 130, a small variation. But now we have our storm, which is a speed of 80 kilometers an hour forward speed. So the front right quadrant would be 150 plus 80 is 230 kilometers an hour. The front left would be 150 minus 80 equals 70. Thus, the peak three second wind gust of this storm would be 230. The maximum winds would be 230 kilometers an hour. That would put it as an EF3. Okay, so what I'm basically saying is the forward speed is critical of these storms. I don't see it being emphasized enough because um, it really does mean it's not the rotation speed we're talking about. It's the speed, the ground speed, the speed of the winds over the ground that determines the damage. Like I say, in Canada, Environment Canada goes out to the site and, the, and from the damage characteristics, they determine what sort of wind would have caused that. And then that'll be their peak speed, and then they'll categorize the storm, say, as an EF3. You know, but in the U.S., it's done more with the radar of the act on the actual storm, and that's going to be a different thing. So these storms, there's not consistent damage within the storm. This is also important, I think. It means that if a tornado is heading directly for you, then do you escape for it from it on the left or the right? You escape on the right right because the right will be that'll uh, from the tornado's perspective that'll be its left flank or left front quadrant and that's where the wind speeds will be minimized if it's moving if it's rotating counterclockwise bad luck if the rotation's clockwise and you go off to the right in that case you'd want to go off to the left so you, know, you see a tornado coming first of all see which way which way is it rotating clockwise or counterclockwise and then depending on that you go left or right hard to figure out if you're in, in a panic as it's approaching you it also means that the most severe structural damage is on the right front quadrant from the tornado's point of view and another thing is that the pressure in the eye is as low as 0 0.4 atmospheres that's about 400 millibar so the suction is enormous in, within the so-called eye or within the low pressure area of the tornado. Many sealed houses, et cetera, would literally explode in the eye of, of a tornado. And I'll get to this diagram um, in a bit. But I, I, I want to show you some, some photographs here. Okay, I want to show you some images. Um, yes, yeah, so... So here we go. These are some images um, of damage. I'll show you some of the radar images in a moment, but these are images of some of the damages. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, Kinburn and Dunrobin, Gatineau. This is the path of the EF3 across the river. This is Ottawa. There was Arlington Woods area out to, to uh, Greenboro. South Ottawa. Notice they don't have a path. They haven't determined and mapped that yet. And then the Calabogi um, one, and then there were three in Quebec. This is a power station, the Maravel power station that was knocked out um, either by roof debris from houses, well, a combination of roof debris, flying roof debris from houses that were just, um, um, just west of this power station or um, high winds on the station itself. I mean, you can't see too much. There's a lot of panels of houses and fiberglass. There's uh, stuff hanging from the wires. Um, there, you know, lots of sh stuff here, but I mean, the main structures, uh, you know, look okay, but they have to rebuild those. Again, it supplies 40% of the power. There's a tree uprooted, um, some debris um, nearby. And then this is some of the trees that were sheared off and fences knocked over. Um, so just a selection. And you can go through, I'm sure you've seen lots of these pictures, branches completely taken off trees, uh, going through cars. This is a structure here, completely destroyed basically. Um, that's uh, that's um, west of, of uh, Dunrobin. 
between Dunrobin and Kilbourne, um, more structures and things.